Welcome to Biblio Strand. This is the first installment of Shakespeare, a series where I will try to read or listen to all the works of William Shakespeare over the course of a calendar year. The first play I will be reading is Twelfth Night, published in the early 1600s. 1623. It is a comedy and also goes by the name What You Will. All right, I'll give you my thoughts later. So I'm not very far into this, but it has just occurred to me that this is the Shakespeare play that She's the Man is based off of. I've never seen that particular movie, but I may, I may try to see if I can stream it um, don't have internet here, so it would have to be sometime when I'm over at the school working in the evening. But just, like, I knew that was based off of a Shakespeare play, but somehow I'd forgotten it was this one until I'm reading this going, oh yeah, this sounds familiar. Um, not really sure what Viola was hoping to get out of everything. Uh, we we will see. So I just finished Act 1. It's a bit tricky getting back into the language after having not read Shakespeare in a while. But I'm starting to get there, I think. And I must say, it most reminds me of Much Ado About Nothing, which is another comedy, so I can see why I would draw that parallel. There's definitely some really fast back and forths going on. I think so far my absolute favorite line is between the clown and Olivia. It said, the clown says, good Madonna, give me leave to prove you a fool. Olivia, can you do it? Clown, dexterously, good Madonna. And they, they have a good relationship, it seems, but that's just such... A funny line in my opinion and so here we are at the end of act one um, Viola in disguise has gone to Olivia to deliver the count no the Duke's the Duke's um, uh, declarations of love <laughs> but what we're seeing is that Olivia finds herself in love with the messenger. Dun, dun, dun. So I finished act two, and I think that I can figure out quite a bit of what's going to happen, and I'm passingly familiar with some of the plot, but also a lot of these tropes are, are more common nowadays, and, or I don't know, they were common then. And I think it's going to boil down to a whole lot of mistaken identity. That's my prediction. As soon as they introduced Viola's twin, Sebastian, and we're like, oh, they look alike. It's like, ah, yep, there it is. So I think I've worked out a bit of where the plot is going, although there's this character, Mariah, and Toby and Andrew, I haven't quite figured out where they all play into everything. And Malvolio. And it seems to me Malvolio is, is our villain for the night. Although he doesn't really seem like that bad of a dude. So maybe he's more of an antagonist than a villain. Um... I just made note of a few, a few good lines from this, this act. The first being a sadder line. She is drowned already, sir, with salt water, though I seem to drown her remembrance again with more. That was from Sebastian talking about Viola, who he thinks died. They both think that each other has died in a shipwreck. So it's like, oh, that's sad. And then... I tend to write down funny lines. It's my, it's my favorite part. So Malvolio is in the gardens and Andrew 
and Toby and Fabian are watching him and they're tricking him into thinking that Olivia is in love with him. So Malvolio is just kind of talking to himself at this point. Malvolio, besides, you waste the treasure of your time with a foolish knight. Andrew, that's me, I warrant you. Malvolio, one Sir Andrew. Andrew, I knew twas I. Like, I was laughing so hard, I had to stop and write that down immediately. And then um, a quote that I always felt was pretty common, but other people seem to have not heard it before. And that's, be not afraid of greatness. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. And I think that's a great quote. I was a little surprised to see that in this play, it's not delivered with any earnestness at all. It's part of a fake letter to get Malvolio to think that Olivia loves him, but what you gonna do? All right, I'm making some dinner now, and then I'm hoping that I'll We'll finish up the play after dinner. All right, on to the final scene. Pretty sure that this is where all of our mistaken identity hijinks are going to kick into play. Um, we have Viola still dressed as Cesario, and now Antonio is in the mix, who knows Sebastian, and he has mistaken her for her brother. And now she knows her brother is still alive. And we've got various people in love with other people who don't know each other's identities. So here comes the final act and let the hijinks ensue. Act four was a little bit disappointing. It was super short and didn't really deliver on the uh, aforementioned mis mistaken identity hijinks. What? So, I'm hoping that Act 5 will give me some of those hijinks and not just kind of finish things up with only the audience really being the wiser. I don't know. I think it would just be more fun if it... it Sebastian and Viola kind of come together in like that Spider-Man meme where they're pointing at each other. I don't know. That just tickles my fancy. All right. I got about 10 pages left. So uh, let's roll. All right. So I finished Twelfth Night and it was okay. Uh, not my top Shakespeare by any means, but I've also only read a very select few. It was apparently the last comedy that he wrote, so maybe he just gets less amusing as time went on. I don't know. We shall see. Anyhow, the last act was, was, uh, I did get my Sebastian and Viola in disguise as Cesario meeting up and having that what moment, but, the, overall, there were fewer hijinks than I would have hoped. So I don't know what that says about me as a reader. Maybe I'm just not refined enough. Um, for when I come back next, which should be through the magic of editing in just a few moments, I will be reading through Henry the Sixth, Part One, and we'll see if I decide to go through Henry the Sixth in one marathon session next weekend, or if I split it up into little bits over the week. Uh, Twelfth Night was fairly easy to knock off in one day, just uh, a few hours, and that included me pausing in the middle for a long phone call with my mom. So I do think that this represents either a weekend session or perhaps spread throughout the week into smaller sessions. All right, we're continuing on with January's Shakespeare experience. And we are going to do my first ever Shakespeare history. 
I'm glad that I'm not saving all of these for the end of the year. But also, I'm just not looking forward to these ones as much. We will see. You never know. Uh, so the first one, I'm following some calendar. I'll have to look it up and link it maybe. But that's why I have books already laid out for me. Um, doing Henry the Sixth, Part 1, 2, and 3. These spines are really hard to read in this light. There you go. Um, so there's certainly background noise. I can't imagine that there wouldn't be. It's a blizzard day. There's about 60 mile an hour gusts and just almost no visibility. None of the stores are open. We called school early yesterday. Usually I don't go in on Sundays, but um, there's a few changes at school and a teacher and I switched classrooms and we got the furniture and all that stuff into the physical room where it's supposed to be before school was called yesterday, but my furniture is not really arranged and things need to be put away neatly. Um, I'm going to be getting, my class size is going to be about doubling. So I need to, I need to go just get that all squared away. So I will be going in tomorrow, but obviously I just don't want to walk over there today. It's the weather's gross. I am going to listen to these on Audible, and I probably am going to work on a jigsaw puzzle instead of follow along in the book. Just, I don't know, it's a lot. It's, it's like seven and a half hours if I follow along. I'll probably follow along sometimes in the book, like when I go to bed tonight, but I, I can't imagine doing that the entire time. So I'm going to work on Jigsaw Puzzle, listen to it, and then at some point I'll probably also watch a recording of a performance. Maybe while I'm working at school tomorrow I can watch like part one. Um, yeah, I'm just, I don't know, it's my first Shakespeare history and I'm a little nervous. I really hope that I find it enjoyable. I hope that also the language is easier for me to get into this week because with Twelfth Night last week, it was a little rough at the start and then by the end I was kind of getting into it. So hopefully, you know, since I've already done one recently, the transition will be a little bit faster this time. Um, Anyhow, I, you might also hear my sink running back there. I got just a trickle going so that the pipes don't freeze. Even though I'm not really... Like this, this apartment's connected to a generator. So even if power goes out in other parts of town, I should be okay. But it's a pretty old building, so you never really know. I don't know, six one half dozen the other. Um, I've, I've had both of my space heaters running almost all day and it's it's still chilly. As a matter of fact, sitting on the floor here is getting really cold. Um, don't mind my hair. I've been in and out shoveling because if I wait until the storm is done to go shovel, uh, I might not get very far before I tire out. I went and shoveled part of our walkway and it was already up to my knees. So hopefully that drift won't accumulate quite so bad before the next time I go out to shovel. And all right, I've got a puzzle picked out. I'm gonna go sit down with my big jug of water and turn on Audible and hopefully this will be more enjoyable than I'm fearing. The thought occurs that Maybe some of you would like to see what a 60 mile an hour blizzard looks like. You can see the blinds rattling in front of the window. And like I'm standing right here above a space heater and I can still feel cool air moving around me. It's kind of 
hard to see the blowing snow out this window. But you can certainly hear it. Let me go to the front. All right. This time I'm in my cunny chuck. See, it's come under the door a little bit and got that carpet square wet. So I will open the door. Um, it's going to make a really loud noise. First thing I bet. Bang the snow off this window so it doesn't come in the door as much. So yeah, it's it's gotten a lot better. It was um, last night that you couldn't see that playground over there. Lean you out here. Ooh, now you're standing in the blizzard. Ooh. But yeah, I had, I shoveled there. A little bit. Someone else also helped me shovel. And then down this walkway, there's a corner that catches a lot of snow. So I've been shoveling there. Ooh. So the storm continues. I'm just laying in bed, watching the blinds rattle. I eventually had to give the little space heater a break. The poor thing has been running for like 24 hours. So I'm going to give it a break, snuggle under these blankets, watch some movies, and then kick it back on before bed because it is... Oh, you probably can't see that. It's 63 degrees in here. So, it is pretty chilly. All right, I finished Henry the Sixth, part one. And two notes. It was super duper rhymey. Like there was giant chunks of the book that were just in rhyme uh, and I've seen I've seen some notes saying that this is one of Sh it's considered one of Shakespeare's weakest plays and yeah I could see that because I also don't really remember the plot except that Joan of Arc was there which I wasn't expecting because European history is not my cup of tea so I I don't know any historical context for Henry the Fourth, but apparently it's the War of the Roses, and apparently Joan of Arc is in this. Yeah, really, the only parts I can remember are Joan of Arc, and that there was like a father and son. I want to call it a rap battle, but it was really a rhyme battle, a rhyme off. Not even a rhyme off. They were just having a conversation, and it all happened to be in rhyme. Of course, you can probably hear that the storm is continuing. It's supposed to continue through the night. Hopefully tomorrow I'll be able to walk over to school, and if I do that, I'm going to pull up YouTube or some streaming service, see if I can find Henry six, Henry 4 Part 1. It's so hard to keep all the Henrys straight, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, not, not a lot of thoughts at the moment, just that I was surprised that Joan of Arc was there and funny to see Joan of Arc written from an English point of view. It's like, oh, you don't pop up as kind of the, the bad guy very often, huh? And, and so much rhyming. 
So this apartment's connected to an old school building. And I finally last night couldn't take the chill anymore. I took one of the things I'd been using as a blanket, just a piece of fleece that was folded in half. And by golly, if it's not about the same length as a window. So last night I went over to, poor heater, I went over to old classroom and just found as many push pins as I could gather and tacked up that piece of cloth and I think it's going to help immensely. But wait until you see the front. Here's my door. You can see the window was already pretty much blocked by snow. But now it's, it's even higher. There's the old school I was talking about. All right. And here, when I said that I was out shoveling yesterday, it's a good thing I shoveled. This morning looks like this. But luckily, most of it's only about as thick as that there. So, I'm going to get that cleaned up. Go buy some groceries. And go to work. Alright, I know that these storm updates probably get really silly, but I have to do this one. Just, it's a west wind instead of an east wind this time, so new blizzard, but it's, it's quite amusing. So you can see all the snow that has already come. And then the little puffs of new snow. I had to make sure all of my winter gear was inside the apartment proper. So you can see over here the top of this heater. It's just all wet from melted snow and the carpet's getting all wet. So I wanted to make sure my winter clothes were warm in the morning. Ooh, in case I do go somewhere warm and dry mostly. Oh, I can feel it come around this window, too. I will not be opening the door to give you a look outside, just because uh, it already blew open one. So we get a little bit better view in this way. it's the last day of January. I'm here in a new filming location. I switched apartments. So it's been a, a few days since I last read any of the books. But yesterday I went through and did Henry the Sixth Part Two. And uh, I think like, there were more scenes that I remember. I'm still having a hard time keeping track of these characters. And this one, they kept talking about the Duke of York. So every time I heard his name, I have the song, The Grand Old Duke of York. He had 10,000 men going through my head. And I went and looked it up. It's not the same Duke of York. So it doesn't even have that going for it. Um, this is very obviously a setup for War of the Roses. But in my head, I'm like, I know I'm not very good at European history, but I swore Joan of Arc was involved in the Hundred Years' War. And she is. It turns out that the Hundred Years' War and the War of the Roses, they're like, in the grand scheme of history, immediately one after the other. It's like a couple year difference. So we have the setup for... Like this is the setup as with Henry as Henry the Sixth as king, and the Hundred Years War coming to a conclusion. This is really the setup for what's going to happen with the War of the Roses, 
you have all these different people claiming to be the true successor. Um, and you can kind of see how Henry is being undermined by different people who are supposed to be his advisors, I guess. Um, and then of scenes, there's an amusing scene about a man who claims that he was blind and he's been cured and they question him and he's like, oh yeah, that's black, that's red. Then I, how do you know colors if you've been blind your whole life? And that that scene sticks in my head, but I'll be darned if I know what it had to do with the plot. All uh, right, so I'm two thirds of the way through. You could see that part two was a little chunkier than part one. Part three is all that is left, and it is a bit slimmer now. Um, I'm hoping that part three really seals the deal, makes me understand what's going on. Politics is not usually my game, and this is really old politics, so it's hard to keep up for me and figure out who all these characters are. Uh, but, yep, last one for January, and I'm going to read it today because, yes, we are having another snow day. I'm home from school, so might as well. And then I will get this video edited, posted, hopefully by first week. Uh, well, let's trip for this weekend. Hopefully this weekend I can have this edited and posted. And then I will be rolling through onto my February Shakespeare books. So. Last one for the month. I'm about halfway through and I am so lost. I, I fully admit to being unversed in English history. I said it. So none of these characters to me are distinct enough for me to remember who they are. Probably with the exception of um, King Henry, which he's the title character, so that's probably good. And then the ladies, the Lady Jane Grey and Queen Margaret. I, their voices are distinct enough for me to pick up on. Um, they, they took, they took what little joy I was getting out of this by killing off the Duke of York even with his 10,000 men. Um, and so much, so much of this is monologuing. Like, just giant blocks of text, page after page after page, that even though it looks shorter, it, it might have as many words and take as long as the others did. Um, I finally did reach a monologue that I rather liked. It's not Paper Crowns. Holy smokes. It's from Richard, who, having looked these up, I know that Richard ends up being a bad guy. He's kind of a bad guy in this too, but anyhow. Um, He's talking about how he's unable to get the crown and all these different things he has done and how come he can't do that. And it's just got this great, great list. Like, I'll drown more sailors than a mermaid shall. I'll slay more gazers than the basilisk. I'll play the orator. Here goes the furnace. I'll play the orator as well as Nestor. And my footnotes don't tell me who Nestor is, so I'm going to have to go to Google and look that up. Thanks, Shakespeare. Deceive more slyly than Ulysses could. Top notch. And, like Sinian, take another Troy. Here's my favorite line. I can add colors to the chameleon. That's brilliant. And, I don't know, in my head... I never imagined Shakespeare 
know what a chameleon was? I don't know. It's brilliant. I love it. Um, so, yeah, halfway through, I'm going to do a quick lunch break. Still completely white out, or I'd go shovel because the one corner of our boardwalk just keeps filling up with snow, and it was up above my knees yesterday, so I should probably get out there and do a little bit today, but yeah, I'm definitely going to finish this, and then I will see I found a YouTube video from the Shakespeare Network, but somehow it's only an hour long, which seems really short, so it must be an abridged production. Oh, well. They probably know the key points to hit so I can figure out what, what's going on. Other than people A want this king and people B want that king. Alright, let's go. Alright, I realize I'm moving around in the frame every time I set up this shot, but what you gonna do? I have finished four plays for the month of January. The three parts of Henry the Sixth and Twelfth Night. Easily. My favorite one was Twelfth Night. But I was really shocked at how these three ranked. Um, I can already tell that going into Shakespeare's histories Knowing some of the history probably makes them more enjoyable because when I look it up online, people who are kind of versed in British history or are big history buffs, they seem to really enjoy his histories and other people not as much. All right, so I've got my notebook here. I'm going to tell you about my rankings. I decided to use the Copile rating system, which looks at character, atmosphere, writing style, plot, intrigue, logic, and enjoyment. And obviously being the same author, it, it does help with some of this for comparison sake. So let's start with Twelfth Night. I, I gave it a three on characters, which I think, I think I'd be more charitable now that I've read a group of history books. But yeah, when I was reading this, I gave it a three. Um, while I can remember what happened, none of the characters themselves really stand out and wow me. So atmosphere, I gave it a two. And I think that atmosphere is going to be one of the big downfalls in these books because they're the dialogue. It's a play script, it's not really a novel. So there's not a lot of room for setting the scene per se. Um, and world building, I'm, I'm really into fantasy books, so world building is a big part of what I read. So yeah, there's just not as much atmosphere in a script as I would expect to find in a novel. And the rating system is just going to have to deal with that. Writing style 7, I found it amusing, but there were some, some parts that I think part of the problem is the age of the text, which I know I can't hold that much against it. But also, just, I don't know. I don't know. I rated it at the beginning of the month. I couldn't tell you right now. But yes, I gave it a seven. Plot was a six. Thought it was a pretty solid plot. Um, but nothing really to get super excited about. It was mostly people delivering messages going back and forth. I I wanted more hijinks. I've said that before. 
I needed more mistaken identity hijinks to ensue. Logic, seven. Oh, wait. Entry, seven. And there's the furnace. It's impossible for me to get through a recording session without that furnace coming on because it's coming on like every six or seven minutes. Entry, seven. Um, I think that the the basic concept of a lady disguising herself as a man and then falling in love with her employer that that holds some intrigue and this one has been adapted into um, modern day stories and movies so obviously other people find it to have some intrigue too let's see logic I gave it a seven for what the concept is I think that it everything makes a fair amount of sense um, I would say that the shipwreck brother and sister being separated and then both ending up in this town seemingly from random like they got rescued by different people and she came straight to the town but he went somewhere else on the coast and then came to the town that I think is one of the places where the logic is stretched a little thin and my enjoyment was a seven which part of it was this first Shakespeare I'd read in more than a decade so getting into it I think was part of the the issue there and then Henry the sixth so part one um, the characters, I, I said it before, that Joan of Arc is in here, and I did some research. She's not cast in a villainous light because she's French. By, by the time Shakespeare was writing French and English, it, I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't as big of a thing as I was thinking in my head. Um, however, she's cast in that light because... Um, she's Catholic, which Shakespeare is writing to impress Queen Elizabeth, who's vehemently not Catholic. So that is why we get Joan of Arc, Dark Apocalypse version, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and honestly, because Joan of Arc caught my attention so much, I went ahead and gave it a four, even though I couldn't tell you anything about any of the other characters other than, you know, there's dukes and ladies and princes and consorts. I, I don't remember. <laughs> History people. So, yep, yeah, four for character. The atmosphere. Two. I imagine most of this taking place in rooms, you know, the drawing room, the the war room, the court room, it's a room. Um, writing style, I went ahead and gave it a five. Uh, there is a lot of this one with rhyming couplets, like you know, kind of the stereotypical, oh, Shakespeare, you know, never was there a tale of more woe than that of Juliet and her Romeo. Like that kind of writing. There was a lot of that in this book. So I gave it a five. Uh, plot, two, it, it was, it was set up for politics stuff history I don't know. not for me entry four like I said the only thing keeping my attention throughout any of this was the Joan of Arc bits um, logic seven I mean it's a history I would hope I would hope it plays pretty close to the logic scale and my enjoyment was a do uh, you can see my my nifty little drawing here 
Mr. William Shakespeare with his rose. And I wrote, I wrote a little poem. I was inspired by all the rhyming couplets. I forsooth my tooth. This one rhymes many times, but not always. Bad girl Joan burns alone. War of roses, one supposes. I was feeling inspired. All right. Next, we have Henry the Sixth, Part Two. And may I say, I think that this entire trilogy should be called War of the Roses. I think that that packaging would just pop. Can you imagine the three of them bundled together with cover embroidered with white and red roses? Uh, if Shakespeare needs a new PR person, I'm, I'm there. All right, Henry the Sixth, Part Two. Um, so characters again. The only one that ever caught my attention was whenever they would say the Duke of York, and at one point they they mentioned him him doing something for which he'll always be remembered. And I was like, oh, that's the song. And then I looked it up and it is not the song. So I can't even tell you the Duke of York's real name. Two, um, atmosphere. Somehow there was less atmosphere than the first book. I don't know how that's possible. One, uh, Writing style, I gave it a six. There were more scenes that I found genuinely interesting, but it still, I don't know, still wasn't working for me. Plot, I gave it a two. Intrigue, a two. Logic, I gave it a seven. History be history, you know. I'm not saying that again. Uh, for enjoyment, I gave it a five. And I made a note here that it kind of feels like it has middle book syndrome, uh, that I thought it was well written, but I just couldn't find it in myself to care. And that kind of applies to all three of these Henry books. All right, and then the one I just finished today, Henry the Sixth, part three. Uh, the characters, I don't care about any of these people, too. I just don't. Atmosphere, not one drop. Not one drop. I could see this being a stage play because you would not need a lot of scenery. One. Writing style. This one feels like Shakespeare. It, it has a couple of those rhyming couplet lines but they're not overly cheesy. They don't intrude into long monologues. I wasn't interested in what it was saying, but it is Shakespeare, so I gave it an eight. Uh, the politics, or the plot, was all politics. So much politics. Um, the, the only part that really caught me for the plot was when King Edward married Lady Bona, who was also, no, who married, married Lady Grey, when he was supposed to be marrying Lady Bona, and Lady Bona and Margaret and Warwick are all together when they hear the news, and they're kind of all three different sides of this War of the Roses triangle. And they hear that King Edward's gone and married someone else and Lady Bona is like, oh, she, she dead. And Warwick is like, how could he betray me? And then Queen Margaret, she's just having a grand old time. And she's like, yes, Henry going to be back on the throne. Um, so yeah, there was one scene that I was like, oh, this is good. And I think it's because it was all the the interpersonal drama. I guess I like that drama. Um, so yeah, but that was it. That was one scene out of the whole book. It was like three pages. Anyway, plot two.
Intrigue. I went in kind of on enthused. I knew this was just War of the Roses part three. So I gave it a three. Uh, logic. I gave it an eight. Somehow I upped the scale on the logic meter, but yeah, pretty sound. And in enjoyment, I gave it a three. One scene, one scene that I thought was good. All right. So now, if we add up those scores and divide by seven, we have ranking last Henry the Sixth. Part two, it has a 3.57 out of 10. Then Henry the Sixth, part one, which kind of surprised me, comes in third for the month with a 3.71 out of 10. Henry the Sixth, Part Three, a three point eight six out of ten. I felt like I was really dragging this book through the dirt, but apparently, I thought it still held up better than the first two parts, despite my utter lack of caring and no Joan of Arc or Duke of York. Uh, and then. Best for the month was Twelfth Night with a 5.6 out of 10. All right. So for February, I am going to be reading The Comedy of Errors, Taming of the Shrew, Titus Andronicus, and Romeo and Juliet. All righty. No history, so there's that. Bye.